everyone, my name is Vivian. I'm the elementary small group coordinator. We're so glad to have you at church today. There is a lot going on at Park Valley and I just wanna take a few moments to share a couple of things coming up for you and your family. Today, April 8th, is the last day to get the early bird rate for our middle and high school camps. Make sure you register as soon as possible to secure your child's spot and save $70 off the cost of camp. For more information about dates and prices, please visit the student camp page on our website. Spots are filling up fast, so don't miss out. We will be having our job fair May 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you're a business owner and would like to participate in the job fair, then visit the events page on our website to reserve a space. Men, you don't want to miss the next men's breakfast on Saturday, April 21st at 9 a.m. and hear Pastor Barry share his heart and vision for the men of Park Valley Church. Men and boys ages 10 and up are invited to attend. The cost of the breakfast is $8 and you can register online at parkvalleychurch.com backslash events. If you want to find out more information about any of these events or would like to register for one, please visit our website at parkvalleychurch.com. Thank you for being with us here today and we hope you have a great week. Morning, guys. How you doing? Oh, wow. So it's been a busy week. Um, last weekend, of course, we had Easter, and we thank God for what He did. Uh, God did some amazing things on Easter for us. And, you know, we always look at Easter and Christmas Eve as opportunities where just people go to church. So if we can get people in this building, that means we can give them Jesus. We can give them an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. And so um, kind of a couple cool things we had about 51 people saved this past Easter, which is an awesome blessing. <clears throat> we also had right at about, as far as families that registered, we had about 40 new families come and, and check us out at Easter, which was really a blessing. Um, <clears throat> plus, just yesterday was real busy because there were hundreds and hundreds of volunteers over here at Park Valley working on that Feed My Starving Children program. And they were able to, yeah, man, they were able to, so check this out. You're going you're gonna to want to save your clapping here. They put together 116,000 meals for kids. That's awesome. <clears throat> so that, they did a lot of, a lot of good. And um, I really appreciate all of you. How many of you came out yesterday and served? Anybody at all? Wow, look at all the people. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Uh, it made a, made a big difference. Uh, we're starting a new series called Restoring Relationships. And, um, you know, re relationships are really the most important thing that you have in life. Uh, but for whatever reason, we tend to sacrifice the most important things for the things that really aren't that important. And I get it. You know, we all kind of think that way when we're younger. Uh, we tend to kind of sacrifice our relationships so that we can get as many of a, accomplishments as we can get, you know, because we want to achieve and we want to have success and we want all these different things. And sometimes we end up leaving our family, you know, kind of in the wake of all that and they kind of get left behind. And, you know, I'm getting older now. And so I'm looking back at it and I'm thinking, man, I was dumb, you know, when I was younger and I was running like crazy and trying to please everybody, you know, as a young pastor and, and doing all these things, and, and I'm thinking, we got to disciple these guys, we got to disciple these people, and then I, I would stop and remind myself, I got four kids at home that need to be discipled. I got a wife that needs me too, you know, and I get a little choked up about it sometimes when I think back about it, just because we were constantly running, you know, and um, I, I, I just know that every accomplishment you ever have in life eventually is going to be forgotten. It just is, and I know that's not encouraging, sorry. Uh, but it is true. Um, and, you know, I always say that, and I learned from other guys, that, you know, you go on to any college campus and there's a whole bunch of buildings named after people that had a lot of accomplishments that nobody's ever heard of. You know, who is this person? I have no idea, but that's where we have lunch, so that's where I go. <laughs> um, you know, it's just literally the way it is. And the reason for that is because relationships are more important than accomplishments. They really are. And, being in the ministry for 28 years, I've had an opportunity to be beside a lot of people right before they go to heaven, you know, and um, nobody talks about work. They're not. You're not going to believe what we were doing in the 70s. It was incredible. We were blowing out projects like you would. Nobody says that. <laughs> you know what they say? They, you know what they do? They talk about their family. This past week, uh, I did a funeral right here 
at Park Valley uh, for a lady named Patricia. And I got a phone call that she was getting close to heaven and so ran out to the hospital and John, Pastor John and I went out and just got next to her and the whole family was in the room. I mean, there was hardly any, there wasn't a lot of room in, the, in her hospital room. And we're all in there and I'm next to her and I can tell there's, she's afraid. She's got fear in her eyes because, and she told me, she says, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, you know. And, and here she is days away from, from, from passing away. And we were able to share the gospel with her and pray with her right there by her bedside, which was an awesome honor and an opportunity to be able to do that. But the cool thing about it was the only thing she really talked about was her family. That's all she talked about. Because your family is what matters the most. And your family is your legacy. I'm telling you right now, it is. And sometimes you don't see it and sometimes you don't think it, but, um, but it really, really is. And so when... By the way, when you retire, and we'll all retire one day, Lord willing, if we make it that long, um, your company's going to show you the door. They're going to smile, and they're going to give you cake, and probably a watch, all right? But then they're going to say, nicely, get out. Because there's a young guy coming, a young girl, whoever coming your way is going to tear it up with his company, so bye. It's been nice. And uh, the person that's going to walk with you out to the car is going to be your wife or your husband, or your kids, or whoever it may be. It's those people that you want around you. That, that's really literally who your, your legacy is. And so um, we're going to talk about relationships. You say, oh, I, I got lots of relationships. Here's the problem. They're all broken. You know, and what I would say to that is, that's kind of normal. You know, if you're sitting there and you have a, lots, a lot of broken relationships in your life, and you think, I'm a freak of nature because... I got lots of brokenness in my life. Guess what? Welcome to the human race because you're not the only one. You know, we're a bunch of broken people living in a broken world and it just stands to reason we're going to have some broken relationships. So here's the question. Number one, don't get down on yourself. That's not number one, but I'm telling you that. Don't get down on yourself. Um, What I want you to know is, is that, you know, relationships can be repaired. You know, they can be. And, and, and God is in the business of putting relationships back together. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to just kind of give you eight thoughts. Normally I give you three things. Today's eight. Um, but I'm going to try to go through them fast. And I don't know if they really flow or if they really build on each other. I don't think they do. But they're just thoughts that popped into my mind. And, and I hope that they're a blessing to you. The first thing when it comes to relationships is this. I know about everybody in this room... I know one thing about every relationship that you have, all right? Number one, I know you're in it. I know you are in every relationship that you have. And um, that's really kind of a cool thing. And the reason it's cool is because every relationship you are in, which is every relationship you have, means that you have a say in it. It means that you have the ability to influence it in some way. And if it's a broken relationship, then then that means you can do something about it because you're involved in it and you're connected in it. And so I think that's kind of a positive thing that we can take out of being in the relationships that we're in. But I will say this, and it's a little discouraging, but I will say this. Statistically speaking, the more relationships that you have that break, the greater the chances that you're the one breaking them. And I know that's a tough thing to say, and you're like, oh, thanks for the slap upside the head. You know, happy Sunday, you know, or whatever. But you know what? It's true. Just statistically speaking, if you are in a situation or if I'm in a situation where I'm coming out of relationship, broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship, and all I do is blame all of those other people in those relationships, there's a really good chance it's not the other people in those relationships. There's a really good chance that it's, that it's you. There's a really good chance that it's me. And the only way that I'm going to be effective at truly starting to bring health and vitality of the relationships that I have is if I stop looking at everybody else and I start looking at me, you know, because I'm the only one that I can really change in a relationship. And so anything else I just think is creepy. You know, if you start to change other people, oh, I will change you. That's just creepy. Somebody changing somebody. Because normally the only way you change somebody is through manipulation or control or fear or just weird stuff. You know, that doesn't work. So rather than looking at everybody else, and and by the way, 
Blaming is a very natural thing. It started in the Garden of Eden. You remember when God went to Adam and said, Adam, what's going on? I don't think God said that, but he said something like that. And Adam basically said, (laughs) it was her. It was that woman that you gave me. Everything was great before she came. I mean, the Garden of Eden was like one big, huge man cave. I could eat whatever I wanted. I was naming animals. I don't have to dress up, obviously, because I'm wearing nothing. And then she comes along. And I'm going to tell you something, God. Everything kind of has gone downhill. I mean, he literally blames her. It's a natural thing to do. And so God says to Eve, kind of sort of, what's going on, Eve? And Eve said, it was a serpent. I mean, come on, God, it was the serpent. And so blaming is something that's natural. Here's what I want you to know, though. It's just not effective. Blaming somebody else is not an effective, you know, thing to do. It doesn't work. And so I don't know why in the world we do it. I love Luke 6, 42. It says, how can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own? I love that. It's just the visual of that, a log coming out of some dude's eye. Uh, can I help you get, man, you got something in your eye there. Can I help you with that? Well, you do too. You have a log in your eye. And so I think what we need to do is just, just kind of take a look at ourselves. Where can we, you know, um, what changes do we need to make in our own life? And so we focus on our part. Second thing is this. Most of the time you can't change the other person. And like I was saying earlier, anything that manipulates or controls or tries to force somebody else to change, it's just weird. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So um, here's the key. The key is if you want to breathe health and life into all of your relationships, then allow God to change you. Allow God to do the changing in your life. And the reason I say that is because I'm not saying when I say you need to change, I'm not saying that means that you have to change and be everything that your husband or wife or your kids or your friends or or your people at work or whatever are trying to force you to be and and a person they're trying to force you to be like. I'm not saying you got to... To, to be a chameleon for whoever you're with and change to be what they want you to be. I'm not saying that at all. Matter of fact, that's not healthy. I'm saying allow God to change you into the person that he always intended for you to be. Let God transform you. Let God change you. And that really is the key because when that happens, it affects literally everything and everyone around you. When you allow God to transform you into what he wants you to be, there's another word for that. It's this, Jesus is Lord. It's described another way. Jesus is the boss. Jesus is the CEO of my life. He tells me what to do. He's in charge. I come up under his authority. I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to do what he wants me to do. It's a complete and totally different perspective. I belong to him. He's going to change me. The third thing is this. We need to let go of our expectations and give ourselves completely over to God. Let go of our expectations and give ourselves completely over to God. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1 says this. Paul says, I plead with you. Now, you don't ever go up to, if you were to go up to somebody and say something like this to them, I'm begging you. If you say that, you really mean it, what you're saying. You don't, you don't go up to somebody and say, I'm begging you to pass the salt. Nobody says that at dinner. <laughs> that doesn't matter. If you're going to plead with somebody and beg somebody to do something, this is something that's really, really important. This is something that you really, really believe. This is something that you have experienced in your life. This is something that you're saying, listen to me. If you do not go this way, things are not going to work out well for you. I'm begging you. It's a parent that sits down with a teenager that's astray and and doing their own thing, and you're going, I'm begging you to stop this lifestyle. I'm begging you to stop this this path that you're on because you're on a path to destruction. You've got to stop. Paul is literally begging us because he knows firsthand, experientially, this is real, this is true, and if you go in opposite direction, things aren't going to work well for you. I'm begging you. To give. When you give, you choose. Every time you give, 
It's because you chose to do so. What does he want us to give? What's the choice? We choose to give our bodies to God. The word body there refers to the whole instrument of life, the complete person. It's your intellect. It's your emotion. It's your will. It's your physical body. It's your thoughts. It's your interests. It's it's your desires. It's all of these things. Everything that I am, I give to God. And that's why I pray that a lot of times at the end of the service, I say, God, everything I am, I give to you. Everything I am, I give to you. I choose to come up under your authority. You are God. I am not. And I'm going to do what you want me to do. All I'm saying is, is these are steps from God's words that if we start taking are going to bleed health into every relationship that we have. I'm telling you right now. Anything you give over to God completely, God takes and does miracles with. Hannah wanted a kid. Remember that? She's begging God, please, God, give me a child. And if you give me this child, I will give the child back to you 100%. All that he is, I will give back to you. Well, she had a child, and his name was Samuel. And when she gave him back to God, God used Samuel in some pretty awesome and miraculous ways. He became the judge over all of Israel. So he literally led a nation that had strayed away from God back to God. That's what happens when you give something over to God. Samuel leads Israel in conquering the Philistines over and over again. Samuel anoints Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. Samuel has enough courage and enough guts to speak on behalf of God as a prophet to the nation of Israel, to be able to stand up to King Saul and say the kingdom is getting ripped out of your hands because you're disobedient. And Saul's like, what? Yeah, that just happened. That's what Samuel did. That's the kind of courage that he had. That's the way God used him because a mother said, I give him over to you 100% completely. I think about a little boy that had a lunch, a little boy with a little lunch who gave it to a big God and God took it and multiplied it and fed 5,000 people with it. Why? Because anything you put into God's hands, lock, stock, and barrel, he makes it go a whole lot farther than we ever could. And he does miracles with it. And there's, a, there's an apostle that has walked this earth preaching and teaching the gospel, looking at everybody in Haymarket from, from hundreds and hundreds of years ago through the word of God, screaming out to everybody in this room, I am begging you to give yourself completely to him because I know it works. I've experienced his power. I've seen him do miracles. I've seen him take me places I never ever thought I would go before. And I'm just looking for people who are going to give their bodies. After all that I've done for you, literally, it just makes sense that you would give your life to me. You see, here's the thing. When you give yourself completely over to God, that means God becomes the center of your life. And anything else that's at the center of your life begins to be MIA. Begins to start melting away and fading away. And all of us have things at the center of our lives. All of us have things that we say, this is what I love. This is what I can't live without. This is what holds my life together. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's coffee, you know, whether it's sugar, whether it's the absolute incessant desire to always play the victim because of past hurts, whether it's codependency on even a spouse or a child or a friend or a group of people or a status or whatever it may be. We've got whatever it is at the center of our lives convinced that that's holding our lives together. And Paul's screaming, substitute all of that for, for the one true God. Make God the center of your life. And if alcohol is no longer the center of your life, here's the question. How's that going to benefit your relationships? If drugs are no longer at the center of your life, how's that going to speak into your marriage? It's going to really speak into it. It's going to really add life to it. These are life-changing principles of truth from a holy God who is giving us a direction on how to live in our lives with the most important part and aspect of our lives, our relationships. 
Yes, we're broken. Yes, we live in a broken world. But we have a God that can put our relationships back together again when we understand what he teaches us in his word. Look at verse 2 of, of Romans 12. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to be able to test and approve what God's will really is for your life, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Basically, what he says is this. You give yourself over to me. You make me the center of your life. You start pulling away from all of the influence of the world and start allowing me to change you and transform you. God says this. I'll tell you exactly what I want you to do with your life. Specifically. I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, I just don't know my purpose. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Everybody's looking for that. We're all looking for purpose. He says, I'll tell you exactly what I want you to do. Number four. And then I'll, I'll start fulfilling God's purpose for my life. Do you think it's a coincidence that in verses six through eight, he starts giving us this laundry list of all these things that we can start doing. He starts talking about prophecy and he starts talking about serving and he starts talking about teaching and he starts talking about encouraging others and giving generously and leading and showing kindness. He gives all of these different things. I will transform you and as I transform you, I will tell you exactly what I want you to do with your life because I know you better than you know you. And I picked your purpose long before I even made the earth. And when he changes us, by changing the way we think, it changes our values and our interests and our goals and our perspectives. I'm telling you right now, general things that start happening to you on a regular basis in your life, you will see them with different eyes. You will. You will see them with a different perspective. It'll be a heavenly perspective. It'll be a God perspective. It'll be, what is God up to? How is God working in my life? Wow, that was a God thing. And you'll start to see God putting people into your life. Tell me it's a coincidence that there are certain people that are brought into our lives. There's no way. God is up to something. God is working in our lives constantly. And it's amazing to see it really from that, from that perspective. Number five. And by the way, all of those things are very general. I mean, what pastor is not going to get up here and say, make God the center of your life? So you're going to go, okay, I'm going to make God the center of my life. What in the heck does that mean? I probably shouldn't say heck, but <laughs> it's a euphemism. That's what I was always taught as a kid. Anyway. Um, make God the center of your life. Then he'll change the way you think, tell you what to do, then do it. Now go get a donut and have a good day. <laughs> okay, what's, that's great. At some point, does it manifest itself in some pretty specific things that happen in my life? Yeah, it does. It actually changes you. How does it change you? Same chapter. Number five, you're going to start genuinely loving other people instead of faking it. I'm not really good at that, by the way, genuinely loving people. That's hard to say, genuinely loving people. <laughs> Ten times. I'm not really good at that. And the reason is because I'm so stinking good at fear. I'm great at fear. I'm an expert at fear. I think I'm a pro at fear. I'm also a pro at a thing called jealousy. Anybody else like that? You don't want to raise your hand, do you? <laughs> I'm a pro at jealousy, man, yeah. Yeah. Who wants to do that? Who wants to own up to that? But I'm great at it. I'm great at fear and I'm great at jealousy. What does it do? It tends to kind of squash out genuine love. That's what it tends to do. Genuine love is something that comes from God. But I'll tell you something. As he transforms the way you think, he will transform the way you love. And it will be more of a genuine love. Look at Romans 12, 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what's wrong, hold tightly to what's good, love each other with a genuine affection, take delight in honoring each other. There's a word for pretenders, there's a word for actors, it's called hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is murder on a relationship. Why? Because nobody respects a hypocrite. Nobody does. We know that because 
hypocrisy, you know, the, the hypocrite makes a promise to somebody and then cheats on them. The hypocrite, you know, says one thing and then does another. How do you know whether or not you have hypocritical love for somebody or a genuine love for somebody? You ask a very simple question. Here it is. Who does it benefit the most? Who does your love benefit the most? If it benefits you the most, then it could be hypocritical. If it benefits the other person the most, then it's probably genuine. Because here's the thing. Love isn't easy, and love isn't always fun. Sometimes love is a choice, and love is a decision. And so what you have to do is, is you have to make the decision, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice. I'm willing to make a sacrifice when it comes to the way I live, whether it's my time, whether it's my energy, whether it's some kind of a resource or whatever it may be. I want to sacrifice for that person. Why? Because I genuinely love them. I genuinely love them. Number six, be content with God's purpose for your life. I love this verse. Be glad for all that God is planning for you. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. We're so busy looking at everybody else's purpose. We're so busy looking at the, God's plan for everybody else. God, how come out there? My plan's not their plan. They got a great plan, God. They got a great purpose. Man, I love what they're doing. What about me? I'm going to tell you, it's so easy to do. And it's a whole lot easier to do too with social media because we know everything about everybody. We all know what everybody had for breakfast this morning and how they're feeling and, and everything. We know everything about everybody all the time. Everything's in real time. <laughs> and, and most of the time, it's the best of everybody though because nobody puts, hey, that's a horrible picture of me. Let's Instagram that. <laughs> nobody Instagrams a horrible picture of themselves. Here's one with me with something hanging out of my nose. Let's put that on. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? So we start comparing ourselves. And I love what it says. Hey, have a genuine love for people. And also in verse 12, be really glad about all that God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and prayerful always. God may have some trouble coming your way. God may put, have you in trouble now. God may have had you in trouble in your past. But what do we do? Well, we attack it with patience and we attack it with prayer. The Bible says, be patient in trouble and prayerful in trouble at all times. It's a powerful thing because contentment is the antidote to jealousy and jealousy destroys relationships. Jealousy destroys relationships. Contentment is the antidote to jealousy. So it's the person that sits back and says, God, man, thanks for my Thanks for your plan for me. Woo! God, great job. High five. You know? Thanks for my wife. She's amazing. Thank you, God, for that gift of my wife. Thank you, God, for my kids. God, they're incredible. God, they're, they're absolutely amazing. They're such a gift. God, thank you for my home. I don't need a bigger and a better home. I got a great home. This is a wonderful, wonderful home that you have provided for us. God, I am so grateful for my job. It takes an awful long time to get there, God, but I'm very, very grateful for it. I mean, it meets my needs. You gave me my job because you want to meet my needs, and I'm done complaining about it. I'm going to be thankful for it, God. Thank you for your plan for me. What a great plan, God. Thank you, God, for the way that you created me and the way that you made me. I'm me. You made me. And, and I have physical challenges. And I have difficulties that I'm going through in my life physically. But God, every single one of those challenges you've given me have done nothing but teach me to depend on you and teach me to have a clear focus on you. Wow, God, thank you for that plan. I believe in you. I trust in you. I submit to you. And I am very grateful for the plan that you've given me. What does that translate into? A lot of times, verse 15, it causes me, when I'm really happy with God's plan for my life, it causes me to actually be happy with those that are happy and to actually weep with those who weep. I'm actually happy for you because you've succeeded. 
I'm happy that you got a new car. I'm happy that your marriage is strong. I'm happy that you are successful in your career. I am so happy. I truly am happy for you. And when you're sad, I truly empathize with you. And I'm going to come alongside with you, and I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to weep with you, and I'm going to be, have sorrow with you when, you're, when you when you have hurt in your life. It just causes us to be genuine with people. Here's a question. How do you think genuine love and being thankful for all that God has brought into your life and contentment is going to be for your relationships? It's going to be a game changer. It's going to be a game changer in your marriage. It's going to be a game changer with your children, with every relationship that you have. Number seven, be willing to forgive. How many of you believe that sometimes in life you have to learn to just let go of things? Disney believes it, right? I mean, they sing about it. <laughs> Let it go, right? Let it go. Sometimes you just got to let it go. Sometimes you just got to turn loose of it. I had a great, you know, the coolest thing in the world is I get to connect with people all week long. You know, a lot of times people that are hurting. And I got a chance at early, early in the morning to go be with a family that was going to be having surgery. And I got to sit down with a man that I respected. And I got to listen to him teach me for about 30 minutes in a, in a waiting room. And he is really, he's lost a lot of his hearing. So when he teaches, he's like, and you have to, and he teaches loud. And we're in a room full of people. And I'm like, <laughs> but he was just letting it go. Well, no pun intended. He was just teaching me. And he started to tell me a little bit about his life, how he served combat uh, mission after combat mission after combat mission in Vietnam on the front lines, not knowing whether or not he was going to live. He started talking to me about when he came home and he started his business and how they had ups and downs financially and how it was a knockdown struggle, drag out struggle nonstop to try to keep his business going. He talked to me about his family and how he struggled in his family and how he went through a divorce. He talked to me about how when his son turned 40 years of age and out of the blue, his son died. He lost his son. He talked to me about his physical struggles, how he has been in and out of the hospital for month after month after month after month, surgery after surgery, infection after infection, setback after setback. Here's a man that's over 200 pounds that now weighs 140 pounds. And he told me that there were times when he would lay in that bed and he would say, God, just take me home. I don't want to do this anymore. God said, no, nah, I'm leaving you here. And so he looked at me and he said, you know what, Barry? I've been through a lot in my life. He said, sometimes you just have to let things go. You can't dwell on it. You can't let it hold, be held, held over your head. You have to move on. That's what he said to me. Move on. You know what? Forgiveness is probably one of the healthiest things that you could ever interject into any relationship of all. To be able to look at your wife or your husband or a friend or whatever and just look at them with love and look at them with forgiveness and just say, I'm going to move on. I'm going to let this go. And I'm going to love you with a genuine love. Because there's a whole lot more going on here than meets the eye. You know, I think most conflicts are all, I think really all conflicts are spiritual in nature. There's a big picture involved. And we've got to learn to, to let things go and, and drop things. The last thing in closing is this. Number eight, live in harmony with people. Live in harmony. It says, live in harmony with each other. Don't get too proud. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. I love that. In the King James, when it says harmony, instead it says being of the same mind. And when it says being of the same mind, it's talking about opinions and interests. And chances are, put two people together in a room, they're going to have different opinions and interests. But there's a really good chance that they're going to have the same opinions and the same interests on the things that, are the mo that matter the most. I always say to people, 
Christine and I are literally night and day. We are completely opposites. But we've been married 30 years. You know why? Because we have the most important things in common. I always say, even though we're night and day, we have five things in common. Jesus, John, Will, Drew, and Mike. Our God and our kids. That's what's important. The things that really hold you together. The opinions and the interests that you hold together tightly. And it brings harmony and it brings unity and it brings oneness in a relationship. It just does. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? Here's the deal. With God at the center of your life, codependency starts to melt away. God changes the way you think. God tells you what to do. You get involved in doing exactly what he tells you to do. Then we begin, begin to become everything that God intended for us to be. And genuine love replaces hypocrisy. Contentment replaces jealousy. Forgiveness replaces bitterness. Harmony replaces conflict. And all of these things, starting with a solid relationship with God the Father, the one who is changing you, the one who we submit to, all of these things specifically begin to bleed into every relationship we have. No, we're not changing to be what the other person is making us be. We're allowing God to change us into what he intended for us to be. That's what changes everything. That's when all bets are off. That's really the X factor when it comes to relationships. And it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. You can know Christ as your Savior today. Right where you sit, you can put your faith in him. You can put your trust in him. You can know him. And I want to give you a chance to do that right now. For those of you that are here that have never, ever prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you a chance to do it right now. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know that I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe that he rose from the dead for me. And I want you to know that all that I am, I give to you. I give you my body. I give you my mind. I give you my emotions. I give you everything. And I want to be a part of your family. I pray that you would forgive me for my sins. I admit it, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I pray that you would come into my heart and be my savior. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. With heads bowed and eyes closed, how many of you this morning would say, hey, Barry, I want you to know this. I just prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus into my heart. And I want you to know by me raising my hand right now. I'm just going to raise my hand and let you know that. That's great. As soon as you put it up, you can put it down. Awesome. Anybody else say, yeah, that's me. That's me. I want to join these and let you know that I prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior just now. How many of you would say, hey, Barry, pray for me. I've got work to do in my relationships. Would you raise your hand? Wow. God, I pray for all of us. We are broken people living in a broken world, but we serve a, a mighty, mighty God who can bring healing, who can give us hope, who can restore unity and harmony in relationships. But God, it's when we put our eyes on you, when our focus is on you, when we submit to your authority and your power, you begin to change us by changing the way we think. And from that point on, after you tell us what to do, specific changes take place in our life that breathe health and strength and life and vitality into all of our relationships. Because there's a bigger picture involved. It's about eternity. It's about you. It's about love. God, I pray that we would have different eyes, a different perspective on everything, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guys, thanks so much for being here today. Um, know that we have a baptismal pool that is ready to go. So if you have prayed to receive Christ, but you haven't been baptized yet, well, you can get baptized today because we have everything that you need. We got the shirt and the shorts and the towels and 
and the people over there to help you. All you got to do is go get in line. Let them know I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and we will baptize you. Um, also, if you got saved today and accepted Christ, we got a gift for you at the doors. It's a green bag. There's a Bible in it and some devotional material. We would love for you to take one of those uh, on your way out. Let's stand if we could. We're going to sing a song out on hey, our way out. Hey, I actually out. have one announcement to make oh, really fast. I apologize. We were just told by um, the Prince William County Police that 15 going south is shut down over at where the library is and all that kind of stuff. So if That's you're in great. Dominion Valley, you're fine. But if you're going to Piedmont, you're going to be stuck. So you might want to reroute around 234. I guess it's a really bad accident there. So just a heads up. Oh, man. Hey, let's just pray right now over that accident. God, you know, all the people that are involved in that accident right now, God, I don't know what's going on, but for, for an entire road to be shut down, there is some hurting people right now. God, I just pray your hand of blessing and healing and, Lord, those first responders that are acting right now, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom. And I pray, I know minutes or moments are precious. And so, God, we right now collectively as a church family, as a church body, Pray your power over that whole situation. Pray healing. Pray wisdom right now, Lord, for those first responders. And so, God, be with those families and those people that are involved right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. If God's used this ministry to impact your life in any way, then join us in reaching others by going to parkvalleychurch.com giving where you will find different ways to give. We hope you have a great week.